Y'all, it's six o'clock and we've got 32 people here already. Let's go ahead and get started. Andy. Yeah. Welcome. My name is Heather Wilson. I'm the deputy director at Cameron Art Museum. And I'm so happy to see all of you here for this virtual conversation with Stephen Hayes. A couple housekeeping details first, um, just for the the first part of the presentation, when Daniel is interviewing Stephen, if you can make sure that your microphone is off. And um, if you can um, turn off your video, that would be great too, just so that everybody can see uh, Daniel and Stephen. I'll, I'll put the spotlight on Stephen's face. I'm sorry, my dog is barking. <laughs> um, there's a neighbor at the front door. Um, and this is the fun stuff that happens with Zoom. Shush. Gosh. It's my pleasure to introduce Daniel Jones. And Daniel, I'm going to make my introduction of you a little bit shorter than it would have been, but Daniel is our new cultural curator. He's a historian and he's an art lover and he's one of the best educators I've ever met. He'll be interviewing um, Stephen today and uh, I know Stephen needs no introduction to this group. Thank you all for being here. Um, if you have questions, I'll be in the monitoring the chat tonight um, and we'll take your questions at the end. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and get started. And if you already have some questions floating around in your head, you can go ahead and type them up and put them in the chat and then uh, we'll sift to them once we finish uh, me and Steven's part. But um, thanks again for everyone uh, for showing up tonight. And especially thank you to Steven. Um, for anyone who's seen his work already, you already have a really good understanding of just how uh, talented this man is. So it was a real honor for him to come sit with us tonight. Um, a little bit about Stephen. I'm not going to talk too much because we're going to get into it a little later. Um, but he's a North Carolina native. Uh, he went to uh, Central, North Carolina Central and Durham, go Eagles. And I actually saw, he said this too, that he originally was going to transfer to uh, study some form of engineering. But I think, and he'll probably say it better than me, that he knows he made the right decision going down to Georgia, uh, getting his master's in sculpting down at uh, Savannah School of Art and Design. And uh, now he's back up here in North Carolina, uh, currently residing in Durham. He's teaching at Duke University and he's just got, he's still very young, got so much work left to do. And we're just such an honor to have him here today. So uh, is there anything you want to say about yourself? Did I miss anything before we get started? Uh, you did it, man. We're going to go through it. We'll go All right. Through it. Well, thank you. All right. Awesome. So first off, uh, to start this off, um, I want to let you know that I, we've given a lot of tours of your work at Cameron Art Museum. Lots of people have come already to see it and they love it. All ages, all demographics, background, walks of life. But um, me personally, I've taken a lot of kids in there, a lot of fifth graders, um, uh, local fifth graders from New Hanover County. And we kind of play this game with them. Uh, they kind of have these questions flowing around in their head on why people create art. Um, and it's so fun to field all their, uh, their answers. And they're like, maybe because it's just relaxing. Maybe it's just fun. It's just something to do when you get bored. Uh, sometimes people just like to create. Sometimes people have a hard time saying stuff about themselves and they use their art to talk for them. There's just so many ways. So we want to know to start this whole uh, night off specifically, why do you create art? I mean, in the beginning, when I first started making art, it was more to wow my mom and my brother. Or, or, or to make like weapons to attack my brother with because <laughs> he was always <laughs> gonna ask me. Uh, I got an older brother that's 15 years older than me, we were born on the same day. So, you know, I was the one that he would always come bother, he would always come bother me every morning. So I was always trying to make stuff to try and like beat him up with. But uh, they were always giving machines to make stuff with. But uh, now I make art to try and change the way I'm being viewed or somebody who looks like me is being viewed. I'm trying to create that conversation between uh, multiculturals, multi-generational, you know, create that conversation where people talk about what they're going through in today's society or the chance of way, you know, a kid look, you know, looks at themselves, you know, give them a different, uh, I guess, view on life as far as like what they see out there on the media, like, oh man, maybe I should go be a basketball player. Maybe I should go do this or do that. I want to give them different options, you know, like, Okay, you see me as an African American male making art, you know, and this is what I do, you know, because when I was a kid and I seen what I looked like on television, I wanted to be that person. I wanted to be like them. I wanted the same clothes or materialistic things that they had. So uh, basically, I want to create that narrative of giving them a different option or, okay. or being able to change the way somebody looks like them. So it seems like you started to impress your family and then you started making some weapons to, 
attack <laughs> attack your brother. But now, based off of what you make art uh, for now, I'm curious to uh, what inspires you, you know, because uh, there's so many artists today um, and they might make something because it's, you know, it's pretty, it's something nice to look at, or something that's just calming. But what real world factors inspired you to say, uh, I want to put these things in my uh, work so I can change how someone views me? What kind of directs your art into that path? I mean, so before it was just like, wow, you know, making stuff to wild people and didn't really have any like concept or meaning behind it. It was more of like, I love repetition, shapes and form. That still takes place in my artwork. But now I have more of a conscious of thinking about what is my artwork saying and who am I trying to approach or what am I trying to say? So, um, and I don't knock people who are just making stuff just be pretty and to you know make sales or whatever because that's what they do. That's what they good at. That's what they want to do. Um, but going like going to school, you know, undergrad and learning ceramics and all this different stuff, and my teacher saying some stuff that I was just throwing to the side and then like, yeah, that's just trash. Like, you know, just me practicing. Um. She was like, some people call that art. And I was just like, yeah, that's not art, you know? So going to graduate school and being able to, I guess, learn about art or figure out what the concepts are. Because before they were like, what does the work mean? What does this mean? I was like, I don't know what it means. Like, I just want to bring people to it to come up with something, you know? So going to school and then getting a master's and stuff, like, you know, going to grad school kind of like hurt me in a way, not hurt me, but it helped me a whole lot. It made me think about like, what am I visually saying and who is my audience? Mm -hmm. So like, after I finished, it was like, yo, I just can't just make just anything now. I gotta think about what this work is gonna do later on down the line. So that's, that's why I kind of like worked towards, you know, trying to bring a part of me into the artwork and or bring a part of like other people's experience into the artwork to create something, create this conversation. And was that natural for you as a, uh, as a black man to add these historical references and narratives into your work? How did you, cause I, I noticed with your work, as soon as you walk in, it's very clear that uh, not only are you telling like contemporary stories, but there's, I mean, you, we see parts of um, our past as a country. And I'm, I'm curious to, is that because of your own experiences growing up or? It wasn't, it wasn't natural in the beginning. It was more of a, what have I not learned? What do I not know? You know, like I didn't learn much about the transport of people at this point. So how can I bring that to my artwork to as a form of me learning or form of me teaching other people? Um, so that's how we kind of like transpired and, and, and bringing in like history. You know, at the end of the day, I want to make like some kind of like timeless art, you know, where, people are steady learning from it. You know, it's not like, okay, yeah, that was last year's work. You know, like, nah, I want to create something that's going to be like here. It's going to be here for generations because, you know, the next generation is going to learn something from it and they're going to see different things. So it's, a lot of my art has like so many different <clears throat> levels and layers and stuff on tour. Like you go in there one day, you see something. You go on another day, you can probably see something or experience something totally different. Mm -hmm. So, um, just trying to create something that's timeless. Yeah. Well, I really like that idea that you're, you're teaching yourself while you're going through this process. You're, you're learning things that you didn't necessarily know about these stories you're trying to tell. And that makes me want to talk about um, the very first piece when you walk into the huge wings, uh, the fist that's in the circle. And I saw that it was titled Kairos. And now when I first saw that, the only thing I knew was that's not English. So I had to look, <laughs> I had to look it up myself. And I saw that was an ancient Greek word. And the meaning behind that I saw was the right critical or opportune moment or when conditions are just right to achieve a, a crucial action or goal. Yeah. And it just smacks you right there. And it, it kind of primes you for everything else you're going to see in that room. And it's kind of telling you, though, you might be a little uncomfortable or, you know, there's no better time to have these conversations and start these dialogues. And so I was just curious, was that like a word you found after you created uh, that piece or was it already kind of floating around your head? So a lot, a lot of work I make, I want titles. I want a strong title. Like if it's like two words, you know, two word, three word title. 
I want something that's gonna like hit the people right then and there. Like, wow, I gotta go see what this is, you know. Uh, but uh, the, so the titles come last. Uh, sometimes the concepts come last. The concepts might come like very, very last. You know, the concept behind Kairos came last. But the title was there, but the concept came way late. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I make the pieces first. The pieces stay in my head for a long time. They get made in my head maybe several times over and over, and then they evolve, and then it happens. So yeah. Okay. So that's got me um ready for my my, my next question about uh your kind of I guess the idea or the concept coming after the fact. So with Voices of Future Past, with the bus you created of of the older man, I was curious when you decided to. Um, you know, choose young boys' voices for the interviews and not the, the men, uh, or not the voices of the older men we're seeing in that uh, installation. How did you choose that you wanted to have this kind of younger child voice coming out while looking at the work? So I started, a, I, had a, I had a residency in DC that I was about to start. I was gonna be the first part of the first cohort. And while I was driving to DC, I was having a conversation with one of my good friends and she was like, well, you don't, you don't ever have none of the part of you and your artwork. You need to have some of you and your artwork, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm like, what do you mean part of me? Like, everything I'm doing is, is a part of me and, I, and everything. So um, what happened? I just started thinking about incidents that I had as a kid, you know, and where I never talked about what I was going through or how I, I felt I was being seen. So that's why I chose to use kids because, um, that 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 part of the show Voices of the Future's Past with the with the bust and the audio came from when I was a child and I didn't talk to my mom about what I was going through. And it made perfect sense for me to create a safe space for young black men to talk about what they're going through in today's society, how they feel they're being seen or or things that they're going through or you know, events that happen to them. Because sometimes these kids don't have, or maybe they don't feel confident enough to talk to their parents or somebody to talk to, you know, so I wanted to give them the space to be able to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I chose the kids. The reason why I chose the adults to go, the black men, because these black men had a lot of these instances happen to them as well. But how does we as older African-American men, how do we help the next generation? How do we help them grow from from these events that they learned from and then help the next generation. How do we help them not get over, but fight through it and mm -hmm. uh, fall over it, over what they're being, being taught or being seen? So. Yeah, that's amazing. I think you did an amazing job of, you know, fostering like a, a room of comfort and trust to allow these boys to speak. Cause I was, I was able to be present for one of the, the interviews you did with the group of kids and it just, I, I just know for what I've been through growing up, you know, I think there's a lot of men that look like us who were raised by men who are loving people, but are raised by people who kind of let you know it's, it's a tough world out there. You just kind of need to suck it up and keep it moving. But sometimes it just starts with uh, by saying what's happened to, you know, speaking up. And um, what you did with those kids was truly amazing to watch because I know they probably might not have told anyone those stories until you asked them. You just sat down and talked to them. As a, as a friend, I know they looked up to you, but they it was they were able to open up, and it was really fun to watch you do that. Yeah, because I mean, I think you know, as a kid, we grow up, we're just like, you ain't supposed to cry, don't cry, like, you know, suck that up or be quiet. You know, like when I see my kids, I'm like, they start crying, they mad. I'm like, it's okay to cry, like, you know, tell me about it. You know? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Even though they just like two, but you know, I tell them like, it's okay to cry, like, all right, let it out, and. Um, but I think it's good for a child to have, uh, I guess that kind of like child parent kind of like thing together so they can understand like, you know, I can talk to you, I can provide in you. Um, Cause a lot of kids are going through, going through stuff that they don't even tell the adults or tell their, you know, anyone. Um, so to be able to create that platform is something that I want to do. Okay. And uh, you were just saying earlier about, um, I, I can't quite remember who you said it was, but they're asking why you don't put yourself anywhere. Why don't you put, and it's got me wondering because you actually are in a cash crop. Um, you're in the back left corner. Yeah, and I, I think, I'm sorry. I think that 
when she said like put yourself in the work, it's more like putting your your experiences mm-hmm. in your life um, and talking about what you're going through in these these different instances um, or events that happen to you. But I mean, I use I I did put myself in cash crop. I, I let you go on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> No, you're good. Uh, I get what you're saying. I was just kind of piggybacking off of that because you actually do physically put yourself and your work in cash crop. And so I get this question a lot and I hear it being asked on other people's tours. <laughs> How does one cast themselves? We need to know that. Um, now I have somebody to help me. I have okay. people to help me um, cast myself uh, for, for cash crop. So, yeah. So I want to talk about boundless just for a little bit before we start. Uh, opening up the floor for questions from other people who are joining us tonight. Um, so the first thing I want to ask you is when uh, Cameron Art Museum contacted you to uh, possibly create Boundless, when they told you uh, kind of like the story they're trying to uh, bring to life, when they told you what the plan was, did it kind of feel like a natural continuation of the work you already done with Cash Prop? You told this great story, uh, uh, you know, how people got here and the resilience to overcome that. But now you had the chance to create these soldiers walking with their head held high for the first time in their lives to create their own future and to step out of these stories that you were telling with your previous work from SCAD. It just feel like it was, it was an automatic yes for your next step to tell that continuing story of, uh, of I guess, this Black history that's found in all your work. Um, I think that it was, it was yes. It's supposed to be the next step for what I what I what I was creating. Um, you know, coming from cash crop to everything else I've been doing, and it kind of like brings it to like a whole. You know, like yeah. you know, all these stories that I put I'm putting together. You know, you create cash crop talking about the transport of people, and I create end up creating boundless. You know, talking about the people trying to be free. You know, the fight that they have. Um, so I did create some kind of hole. You know, once I seen the, the email, I was like, I was I was in the middle of class. <laughs> they were outside drawing, uh, doing two point pers- perspectives. And I seen the email. I think I called them immediately because they left the phone number down there and I talked to them about, yeah, I'll draw something up for you. I'll come up with something. Like that sounds cool. Like I didn't know where it was going to happen, you know, where it was going to take me, but uh, just saying somebody was interested in me, you know, creating potential monument for for a museum was like yeah, of course I would do this like it was, <laughs> it's like right up my alley so yeah and everything all the stories that I'm trying to tell and the type of artist I want to be so yeah yeah it seems like it just fit right into that story you're already telling and just the image you get from walking in and seeing the cash crop and then walking out and seeing balance it's like man it's it's almost watching a story come full circle you know yeah yeah yeah. Now, for something, a project that large, I'm curious, because I, I bet there's a lot of artists in this uh, Zoom today, too. When you're creating a project on that scale, what is your early stages? Like, how do you conceptualize this from the beginning and kind of steer yourself in the direction of what you want to do? How do you steer yourself in what you want to do? Because uh, where do you start with a project that large? Dream. <laughs> you dream, man. Um you come up with a few concepts, you go back to the uh, to the team that you're working with. Uh, that would be that would have been Cam. Um, and show them your concept. And then we have, you know, at the end of the day, you know, yes, I create the artwork, but it's not my it's not my work. You know, it's not mine in the end. Like it's it's the organization. So basically we we create this kind of friendship, this bond where we go back and forth and we talk about what, what's being made and then once they you know they see the first iteration or the first mock-up maybe they'll say hey why don't you try you know maybe there's something they didn't like so you know I mean I probably went back to the drawing boards probably like two or three times before we came up with boundless at the end um, so yeah it was just a bunch of back and forth like talking and, and, and drawing and sketch-ups um, which end up turning to balance. So yeah. And when they contacted you about uh, this project, had you ever heard of anything of Forks Road or these soldiers? Or? Nah, I didn't know anything about about um, the battle down there or anything like that. Um, so just learning about it and then like send the video. They sent me like the video. They sent me books and everything. 
mm-hmm. you know, learning about that made me think like, man, how am I gonna be able to like bring something up? Like most times, you know, the concept or or the idea doesn't come right away. You know, it it happens. It like grows and it mutates, and then it, and then that's what happens. Mm-hmm. Mutation. Yeah. Yeah. It was a. Uh... A powerful afternoon too, seeing that many people come from that many different walks of life oh, yeah. to uh, the view it be unveiled. You know, uh, it was a real community gathering, um, and kind of lets you know where we're going and what direction we're headed and are attempting to be uh, uh, trying to go in. Because a lot of people don't realize um, in New Hanover County we have the most uh, public monuments to the Confederacy in all of North Carolina, okay. um, and so you're unveiling or. Uh, you and Cam's work for balance is like a rewriting or retelling. It's uh, for the first time ever, I think, in our own city yeah. that we're, you know, we're honoring some real American heroes that, you know, fought for everyone. And so this is my last question I'm going to ask you, and we're going to open it up to everyone else. Um, it being one of the first uh, monuments and statues of its kind in New Hanover County, how do you see your art playing a role, not only um, in our local, but, you know, a national quest for, you know, a common ground and understanding and equality for, for everyone. How do you see your art playing a role in where we're going as a nation? I think the art plays a role. I mean, most time artists here to either ask questions, make statements, so, and create conversation. So my work is more here to bring, create this conversation, to bring people together and talk about things that's happened, like to tell, not, not like real, Tell the real, the real truth, you know, like those monuments were there, you know, the Confederate monuments were there to, I don't know, what was it? To strike fear, to let people know the South was still alive or, or whatnot, but to create a monument like, like Boundless was there, is here to bring in like the next generations and people later on, that's gonna come later on down the line and see these men Maybe it'd be a great grandson or somebody like that. I'm like, hey, that was my great granddaddy right there. And yeah. I'm a descendant of the guys who fought for our freedom or the slavery. So it's gonna keep, continue to tell this story um, and create this this growth, you know, for kids to understand and and to see stuff like this. It, it makes more sense to see something or to tell the truth, some, some type of truth. Um, to connect people. Well, appreciate your time, Stephen, and answering these questions. We're gonna actually open it up to everyone else. Um, so if you like, just go ahead and start putting your, your questions in the chat. I'm just start going through them and and uh, reading them off. And Stephen, the floor will continue to be yours. So here comes the next set of questions for you. Um, and I'm actually going, going to start a little PowerPoint real quick everyone to see a few pictures of his work. Everyone see that? And Heather, if you don't mind, does that actually block my view of the chat? Oh, here we go. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I got it now. Okay. So we have a question right here for you, Stephen. Uh, it says, can you describe the process of casting in concrete for cash crop? Um, casting in concrete for like cash crop is basically almost the same as when I did the casting for um, the UFCTs. Um, I placed the golfs. Well, actually, I strip all the people down so they're like in their underwear. And I place those golfs all over their body. Well, I Vaseline their body up. Then I place the golfs all over their body. Um, once I do that, I create one large uh, mold of them. And I um, cover the mold with plaster. And then I pour the cement inside of the mold. And then that then takes the shape of that person's body. And I end up breaking the plaster off of it. So those are called waste molds. So it's only a one-time, one-shot deal. So that's how uh, cash crop was kind of built. So uh, what I did was do it in, uh, I did the torso, the head, and then the legs. Yeah. And a little follow-up question for that. She also asked, um, and why did you choose concrete for that piece? 
Uh, cement uh, is is strong, yet it's also fragile. You know, it, it breaks and it cracks. Um, so every time I move it, it ended up cracking. And you, th you think about the fragility of life. Um, and also I use cement because it was, it's readily, it's there. It's easy to get my hands onto. And, it's, and you think also about cement, it's all over, everywhere you go. You know, you see cement everywhere. You can't walk out of your house without seeing cement. So uh, it's just like think of those different concepts and and having something that's readily available for me to be able to use. You know, I was in grad school, so my budget was only so much. You know, uh, <laughs> all everything with cash crop came out of my pockets, and I really didn't have big pockets at all. I had little 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 bitty pockets. We have another question. Um... From Alexis, who says that she loved the five pounds piece and she wanted to know what that title meant. Um, five pounds, the title comes from the amount of pressure it takes to release a bullet from a chamber. That's where the title comes from. Um, we have another question that says, uh, this person is curious if you could share with us how many people are typically working on your team. <laughs> right here, you're looking at them. Only one. <laughs> uh, I sometimes I might enlist my wife, but or my sister-in-law, my brother. But what they do is it's 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 a big part because I can't. I mean, I can do it. It's just sometimes I'll be on a time restraint. So I'll give them something that's really easy and simple to do that I can just show them how to do. But most of the time, 90% of everything that's being made is, is from me. Um, but like for Boundless, I didn't do the bronze. You know, we had Carolina Bronze create the bronze for all of it. And we have another question asking, what is the piece of artwork behind you, actually? Um, it is a bust of a woman. Um, it was for another one of my clients, but I don't know if he's going to buy it now. So I have to uh, figure out what I'm going to do with it. And then this one's from Barbara asking, do you have any other projects that might be similar to the USCT project for the future? possibly other commissions of this type? Um, the next commission I will be working on is for, it's gonna be in Charleston, South Carolina. Of, there was a mass grave that was found of 36 bodies. You know, Charleston is known for having mass graves. Um, and this was an unmarked grave that was found of 36 uh, African slaves or African people that were found. And I am going to create a memorial for that, um, for that burial area. Um, and any other commissions come down a lot? I don't know. We'll see. Soon to find out. And this one's from Cynthia asking, how long did it take you to create Boundless? I think that's a question that I've actually heard a lot too on tours. I mean, you got to think about it. Uh, are you thinking uh, physically or mentally? <laughs> you know, um, mentally, you know, I guess as you can say, we've been thinking about creating it, you know, since the first email that I got from Heather and uh, from Ann. Um, physically, it doesn't take me long to create stuff physically, but I, I can't, I don't really like to put it in, in numbers because I don't time myself when I first come in here because I don't, I feel like I don't have the same amount of hours people have in their day. I, I put a lot of time, time into the work and I stay in here a long time creating. So I can't really give you a physical time about how long it took me to create the work. And this one's from Simone asking, who was your greatest influence to create 
and decide to be an artist as your occupation? And what does the term balance mean to you personally? My greatest influence, uh, my mom. Uh, I don't really look at other artists um, or what they create or anything like that. So I'm normally influenced by everyday life um, or events or people who come in my life or things I see on television or music. Um, but I'm not influenced by any artists, like uh, people who make physical things. Um, and then what was the next question? What does the term boundless mean to you personally? I, I guess it's more about the, the boundless fight uh, that we continue to fight and, you know, to fight for, for our freedoms, you know, like that monument um, is casted from descendants and reenactors and they are reenacting or showing our descendants going into war or celebrating um, the win. And then you think about today and, you know, the next generations come in and saying like, you know, these are my, my grandparents or whatever, who are, who pose for this, this, who pose for this monument and, and the continued struggle that we're having today to fight for the freedom of ourselves. Or, or to be created equal. So um, that's why it's called balance. Now, this question is from Bonnie. It says, you said that you create a piece many times in your head before you actually make it. Where does that initial inspiration come from? <laughs> Dreaming. Uh, I'm always thinking of stuff to make. Uh, I guess we have time later on, I can show an image. But I'm always thinking of things to make um so you know it could it could sit in my head for you know a few months and then i'll forget about it and it'll come back and and then just so happen i run into some type of material or something on the side of the road and then i'm even more inspired to create the piece the sculpture or artwork and and then like i kind of i kind of like hoard like a lot of stuff like <laughs> like a bit rat's nest in my office and just the material also helps influence those uh, those those daydreams or whatever I'm dreaming of to create. Yeah. Now this one from Carol says, "How did? Excuse me. How did what you come up with uh, the concepts?" Let me try that one more time. How did you come up with the concepts of the past presidents and the currency? How did I come up with the concepts with the with the what again? The presidents and the currency uh, that you see right when you walk into your gallery on the wall to the right. Um, a lot of my work deals with capitalism, consumerism, and brainwashing, and the ideas of the black body and how our body's being seen today. Um, so, you know seeing the currency and then I used to, I was using a lot of like pallet wood in the back, back then. Um, so pallets and skids were things that they used to create to carry our goods on and, and to sell the goods to different places. So um, that's why I used the wood because it's all talking about capitalism and consumerism. And then just putting the people on, the money on there is, um, it's also the, was also a key because that piece is called a God We Trust. And so just putting the faces on there, it's all talking about capitalism and consumerism. Um, I don't know exactly how I came up with the concept to do it, but um, it's probably just one of those things like, well, let's try and do it. Let's see what happens. You know, I'm one of those people that's always trying to make something, trying to make things that don't really work together, work together. And I always learn how to, when I fail, I'm always learning when I'm failing. So just trying, trying new, new things. Well, this one's from Simone asking, and it's a very good question. Do you have any other artistic interests? Are you a writer, like painting, musician? Um, as a child, um, I performed in a steel drum band that traveled around for like 13 years, just about. 
uh, me and some guys. Um, so I did play play music for about 13 years. We cut a couple of CDs, um, but we don't we don't play anymore because everybody got older. Um, next interest, I mean, I wish I could come up with. I've been thinking about like movies, like how to design uh, a movie or scripts and stuff like that. So I have a couple of concepts in mind that I want to do. I just got to find writers. Yeah. Well, I still love making physically, but I love movies as well. So that might be the next thing. Okay. We'll be waiting for them. Now I'm curious, do you still play the steel drums? Uh, no, I don't still play it, but I'm still in contact with those guys. Um, like we were basically brothers for like 13 years. So I mean, we still are. We still in contact with each other, even though we everybody like have families and went off and did so many amazing other things. Um, but no, I don't play them anymore. So this one's from Ann asking. How has your experience of being in your body as a black man evolved over the years from when you cast yourself in cash crop until your hands in boundless? How has the experience changed? Yeah, I can read it one more time for you. It says, how has your experience of being in your body as a black man evolved over the years from when you uh, cast yourself in cash crop until your hands in boundless? Um, I think my experience has changed that there are, you know, at that point in time, I was just going to school and I was trying to figure out like, what's a, what else I going to make? How was I going to graduate? And how was I going to wow my, uh, my audience and wow my teachers and my school and all that stuff. But now that I've become, you know, older and experienced a lot of stuff, there are so many um, so many events or things that happen in the world that I should be able to bring forward and create create these conversations for people. You know, I think that my work is here now to to connect people. And I want to use I want to use my work for the greater good, you know, for, you know, not only to like help support my family, but to help support the next generation of artists, the next generation of, I don't know, whoever, whatever you wanna do, but I wanna show people who look like me that there are other paths that we could take to be successful. Um, my work creates so many other conversations that connect so many people. I think that from cash crop to now, I mean, even though cash crop created create so many conversations with people. I feel like my work is here for a certain reason. I'm here for a reason and I'm here and I'm doing it. I mean, I don't, I don't have the words to answer that question, but it's more, there's a reason why I'm here to create art and, and I'm doing it now. Hello. I'm still here. Um, so this one is from uh, Janice. Who were the men that you used and what was that experience like molding them? Uh, Janice, are you talking about uh, cash crop or? I'm boundless? talking about uh, boundless. Okay. Uh, so the men were that we used, um, when we were coming up, when I was coming up with the concept, I told the people at camp that I needed, I wanted to cast the um, the descendants and some of the reenactors. So some of the men are the descendants and reenactors of Boundless. So that's who the men are. And this is from Cynthia. She's asking if you could talk about the piece she viewed as Jesus. The Jesus piece. Um, the Jesus piece comes from uh, when I was a kid, I always, uh, you know, you look at television and you want to be, you want to emulate the people you see on television. And sometimes you see, you know, people who look like you. And I, I wanted, 
I wanted the type of clothes that these guys had on. I wanted the type of cars that these guys had. You know, I wanted those rims, even down to a point where I ended up buying a car from somebody that was total and I wanted to fix it and put these, you know, 20 inch rims on. You know, I was caught in that wanting to be like everybody else, you know, to be like the Joneses or wanted to wear these certain types of clothes and, and look a certain type of way. Because that's the way, you know, society says you are or the way you look or you act. Um, so the Jesus piece comes from from that. Like, you know, these guys just always boast about their 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 clothes and their chains and what they're wearing. And um, if you look at the Jesus piece, the the necklace is actually noose links, and it's talking about the same rope you climb up on. It's the same rope you're being choked out by, if not you, then somebody was trying to be like you. So that's why it's all noose links. But then you also have the horse and the pond in there as well. And it's talking about like the pawn um, in the game of chess, the pawn is there to allure and attract your opponent to make them do what you want them to do. So today we have these pawns on these pedestals. So I mean that the pawn is winning, this pawn is making all this money um, because at the end of the day, he's alluring and attract the mind of all these young kids to want to buy these materialistic goods that then going back to these companies tenfold. The horse is there because, you know, in the in the the Willow Lynch letter about how to make a slave, he compares people to horses. Say the same way you break a horse, the same way you break a male slave. You whip them into existence. You beat them to that affair of God in them. And he gave this this list of how to make a slave loyal to you to the end of time. How you pin the nappy hair person against the person with uh with curly hair or a light-skinned person against a dark-skinned person where you create this hierarchy where they're always tell telling on themselves or trying to compete against each other. So um, that's where the Jesus piece comes from. It's just, just talking about like how we're always trying to be like what we say on television. Well, yeah. And this one's from Linda asking, have you heard from the National Museum of African American History and Culture about exhibiting there? <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> um, nah, I've been at this for years now. Um, so I have not heard from them. Um, yeah. This one. They know who I am, though. But That's I have. Right. Now, this one, uh, this person is asking: Is there any sculpture or projects that you would like to do if you have time? Man, um, if I had time, sculptures or projects I would like to do, I don't know yet. I mean, um, I just, I just finished a sculpture. Uh, probably on the on the seventh of this month uh, that I've been thinking about for a few years. So um, I think, and then now there's another commission piece that I'm that I'm going to be working on. I can't really give the gist about what it is uh, because I'll be working with a whole new medium that I never worked with before. And I just want to see if it's going to work. So um, there are some projects down the line that I'm that I'm working on, but I can't really give give out what I'm working on. Yeah. And this is from Jessica asking: Have you thought about building or adding clothing to the bodies? Uh, Jessica, are you talking about cash prop? Um, yeah. Let me just see. What do you what, what when you say clothing? What what do you mean? Jessica, you still um there? yeah I'm here. Can you hear me? Um, in future, I just think it would be an interesting way to tie in um the capitalism's abuse of people. It also just I think what you said about the Jesus necklace made me think about that. Um, since you seem to be so interested in casting bodies. Well, I mean, I've I've thought about that, but um, 
I, I decided not to to like use those people's logos or whatever it is those materialistic things. Um, at the end of the day, I ain't, I don't have a lot of money, so <laughs> I'm not gonna go out there and buy these materialistic goods. Um, but I have thought of an exhibit to create, um, not using clothes, but I guess using like song lyrics and other things. But um, for the most part, as far as like doing the whole body or stuff like that, I'm not really doing that much anymore. It's, it's kind of like taking the shape of the horse, so yeah. Now, this is from Simone asking, <laughs> do you still have the steel drum? Is it in your possession? Um, it's not in my possession, but I'm still in contact with the director, the guy who taught us how to build, how to play the steel drum. He is, uh, he lives in Hillsboro. He still builds steel drums to this day. Um, so if I ever wanted one, he would give me one. They, nah. just, they take up too much space at the moment. No, I'm curious. I have to ask to piggyback on that. Um, what got you into steel drum? Because you know that's not your average middle school band instrument. Um, so they, this was outside of school. Uh, my mom will always put me in programs like the Rites of Passage, which teach you about your African American history and everything. While I was in the Rites of Passage, um, I seen some guys um, in the same building practicing uh, on the steel drum. And I ended up walking in there and I was talking with them and they told me, hey, just come in to practice and, and see what you can do. So that's how I ended up getting into playing a steel drum. Um, it just happened, yeah. And this is from Matt asking, what artists, historical and or contemporary, do you find inspiration from or admire? Uh, Matt, I really don't look at other artists. I don't look at, much at all you know um i barely really listen to music when i'm building or uh making anything um so i mean if it was any like an artist i like j cole um i mean it'd be like a musician or something like that um somebody i would want to collaborate with you know a j cole or jay-z or or somebody like that along those lines. Um, yeah. Now this is from Alexis and I, I really like this question. It says, with the movies you want to make be adaptations of your work? Um, yes and no. They, um, I like adventurous movies or like sci-fi movies. So it might be a sci-fi-esque like, uh, historic like movie or whatnot not not like a uh what's the name of that movie that was that show that was on um i forgot what it was but they, they introduced like the green book and stuff like that not like that kind of uh sci-fi but like a back to the future or type of sculpture i mean a uh, movie this is a recent film um, the one I was just talking about, they introduced the Green Book. It came out probably like two years ago. Okay. It's a show. Now, let's see. Now, this is from Bonnie asking, has being a dad influenced your work? Uh, I don't know if it has or not. Um, I, I really don't know how to answer that question. I'm, I'm always thinking of things to make and just always dreaming to create. Um, I mean, if, if one thing, being a dad made me a whole lot tighter, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like making, one day when they get older, a little older, I'll bring them in here and we'll, I'll show them how to do stuff because right now they're still trying to emulate me and see what I'm doing and they, they get hammers and stuff and try and do what I do. But when they get a little older, I'll, I'll have them in here. We'll, we'll try and make stuff. This is from Barbara asking, is there anyone else in your family that are artists? Do you come from a long line of creatives? 
No, nobody else really. Uh, my brother was a cosmetologist. Well, he still is. I got a little cousin. Uh, she was working for CNN at one point in time. Um, but she does she does art as well. She has her own company, uh, which she's doing very well in Atlanta. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just me that does like physical artwork. I had an uncle that did construction and stuff like that. But other than that, it's it's just me that does that does this. Now, this is from uh, Jamie Nash. She says, I find your work to tell so many stories. One story I see is that the wealth of our Black culture stands regardless of how it has been appropriated or stolen. The forms with cotton hair makes me think the most, excuse me, makes me think this the most. Would you say Voices of Futures Past is a testament to that? Um, I was kind of lost on the question. You can give me that. Yeah, yeah, I'll read that one more time. It says, uh, I find your work to tell so many stories. One story I see is that the wealth of our Black culture stands regardless of how it has been appropriated or stolen. The forms with cotton hair makes me think this the most. Will you say Voices of Future Past is a testament to that? I think Voices of Future Past is, is here to, I guess, enlighten people about what we're going through today and, and what we continue to go through. So, um, Yes. <laughs> now, I actually have to insert a question. I know I've already used my time to ask questions, but I'm just curious with, uh, you know, a lot of people walk into your gallery and uh, they, they go silent for a moment because it's, uh, it's tough. I mean, there's a beauty to it, but it definitely gets you thinking as soon as you see it. And I'm curious at any point in time when you're working on this, does it ever get tough for you? And do you have to take a break sometime? Do you have to step away from it? Uh, no. But the, the first one of the, one of the goals I have is to be able to stop my audience in their tracks and make them want to go see and study what I made. You know, right in the middle of their walk, and I want them to stop and be like, "Wow!" And I want them to study and figure out like what what was what was I trying to say or come to it with their life experiences to uh, to see something else in the art world. Um, when I'm making. I like to say I'm in a machine mode when I'm, I'm just thinking about creating. I'm trying to bring what, what I was dreaming or daydreaming about to life and, and give this, this object that I found or these things that I found on the side of the road a new meaning. Um, so I'm not thinking about what I'm creating. Like when it came to cash crop, I was in my studio, I was in a small studio, like a little like storage room creating these figures. I was in there day and night. That, that exhibition took me five, five months to create that, that cash crop. And that's day and night working, maybe not even sleeping or eating. And I was just in there and I wasn't thinking about doing that stuff. I just knew I wanted to create. I mean, it probably didn't take about probably like two months to realize what I created, you know? Um, and that's when I was blown away, when I typed my name and I seeing all these images coming from my artwork. Um, I'm still, I still don't, like, I understand the level of, of what I've created with, with Boundless. I understand what I created. I understand what it's saying and, and the people that it's connected to. But in my head, I don't know what I created. I mean, I know what I created, but I don't know what I've done or, or who, you know, who I am, you know, a lot of times you need to know, you know, if people ask you to do stuff, you're like, all right, yeah, I'll do it. Like when I was artist or when I was younger, I was just jumping to do all these different things and, you know, not want to get and not get compensated and not knowing, I didn't know who I was, you know, and, you know, I know I created Boundless, but I still don't know the level of where I am at this moment, so. A lot of people are like you're famous. I'm like, nah, I'm not. This is something I created. So, yeah. Now, I want to ask one more question too, because uh, the picture I just brought up is from uh, installation of Cash Crop, but in uh, another building, not Cameron Art Museum. Yeah. And I noticed that the 15 uh, men, women, and children, you know, they're kind of uh, at the front or on like the deck of a boat. 
Yeah. Now I'm curious, how do you decide on how you're going to install this, uh, uh, this installation of uh, wherever you go? So this was 2012 at the, um, at the Gantt Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. They had this carpet in there um, at that point in time. And they were like, hey, can we commission you to do something on the floor to create a floor to put all the statues on? Um, because we, uh, we had this ugly carpet and we want, <laughs> want, to, want to be able to see the chains and all that stuff. So I ended up making this, this ship and putting them on the ship. Um, and then in the floor, the ship shows like a map of the world that was carved in the floor. Um, but you can't see it in the image. So that's that's how I came up with with Bill for this this installation. So yeah. So we got about five minutes left, I believe. Is there any other questions that anyone has for Stephen before we wrap up here? Um, if not, man, I could uh, share my screen and show y'all what I just made. Um, oh, so please go ahead. Let me um, stop sharing my. It'll come up. Oh, there we go. Oh. Sorry, it's kind of crowded. So this is a sculpture I just created um, at the Nasher. And my thing is going to start going on its own. Sorry, it's jumping so fast. Oh my gosh. So I just created this sculpture at the Nasher um, for an exhibit that they have. Can y'all see my screen? Um, this is called Flying W. Um, I like using the horse imagery in the artwork. Uh, but with my horses, what I like to do is call the legs off the horse, put different length styles and designs. Um, you know, back in the day when you had a horse that had a broken leg, nine times out of 10, you can put the horse down because it's useless or it costs too much money to nurse that horse back to health. Um, so what I do, all will throw the legs on there. If I was take the horse down and put on the ground, it's going to fall over because there's no three to four legs that are the same length. Um, so that's a metaphor for we're giving everything we need to destroy ourselves. Um, but this piece is called Flying W um, because there was a hole that this guy named um, James Berry created called the Flying W that he would put on the horses where he would tie the front legs up and pull the, pull the legs back when the horse got out of control. And, and what that would do would make the horse fall forward. Um, let's see if I can make this image bigger. In the and then so he he ended up saying this um, that he wanted something with which he could so the blank space is a is where he had the word horse but I wanted people to fill it in I wanted something which I could put that I can compel a horse to do what I want him to something that I can take off after I am through with it without the horse realizing that he was at a disadvantage the whole time, all the time. So they will put bags over these horses and uh, basically waterboard the horses and stuff to like push them in to put their will on the horse. Um, and I think about today and how these things kind of exist with people like in, in, in our society today. Um, so all the legs are all like tied with these ropes. But if you look at the hands of the statue, they are um, in the shapes of holding a, a hand, a, a gun or a rifle. They are leading up to the legs. Uh, but yeah, that's flying W. That's the piece I just finished uh, on the 7th. Where is it located right now? It's at the Nasher Museum in, uh, here in Durham. Okay. Yeah, this. yeah. 
Uh, got a question from Simone asking what the W means. Um, that was the shape that the that the that the the body of the horse would make as it fell forward. And I think this is some really good questions to wrap up with this. Uh, Cynthia is asking, do you have a permanent exhibit someplace and where will you be exhibiting next? So I think everybody wants to know what's next for Stephen Hayes. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't have um, any permanent things except for the monument at Cam. Um, but that's it. Um, it's still under works right now. Well, thank you, Steven, so much. I want to thank everyone who uh, registered and came and uh, sat in with us today, even though it was digital, but uh, powerful nonetheless. Uh, thank you so much, Cameron Art Museum and Heather, of course, for setting this up. And big, big, big thank you one more time to Steven. Uh, it's been an honor sitting here with you and even a bigger honor to be able to do your work and do your talent and have a station at Cameron Art Museum, especially Balance, which isn't going anywhere because we're going to be really sad when you take your other stuff back. <laughs> no, at least we got Balance for good. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah. And I just want to give a quick plug. You can see Stephen in person on February 19th at two o'clock. He'll be on a panel talking about Boundless at Cameron Art Museum. You can buy tickets to that online. He'll be back on March the 5th to do, give two gallery talks in a Voices of Futures Past and tickets are on sale online. And he's doing a special uh, program on March 20th, the closing date of Voices of Futures Past with Mike Williams of the Black on Black Project. So you can check out our website and um, find out more there. Thank you, everyone. This was so much fun. We are so grateful. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Heather. Thank, thank you, Heather. Thank, thank you, you Fly Ryan. Girls, for showing up. <laughs> yes, thank you, Fly Girls. <laughs> thank you all. This was awesome. Everybody, this is great. Hey, Sony. <laughs> Bye, guys. I think that was Aquanetta, but thank you all. It was beautiful and very impressive. And mm. as always, David did. Uh, did a great job in facilitating. Uh, this is first time I really encounter him, so you want to give him some congrats. And of Woo! course, we all okay. love Steve. We okay. all love Stephen. So, and Anne and Heather, thank you for your vision and bringing this to the Cameron Arts Museum for the public yeah. sculpture for people to see. So yeah. again, thank you all, and it was wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Carol. Woo. Bye, guys. Have a great Bye. night. Okay. Good night.